Um, turn your Bibles to Luke 17. In that last song, I'm going to tell you, um, I don't know what your battle is today, but every one of us has faced a battle this week. Of some, maybe it was a big battle, maybe it was a small one. But you faced a battle this week. And if you didn't get any, if you don't get anything else out of what, listen, I know Glenn is not going to get a word out of what I'm about to say because he didn't get home at 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> He's about to be snoring and taking a nap over there in just a second. And that's okay. I just appreciate him being here. Um, if you don't get anything else out of what I say today, that song that we just sang says it all. Whatever you're facing, whatever you faced, whatever may be around the corner, that battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. And I can't tell you how many times in Scripture we read, amen, say it, sister, that's right. I can't tell you how many times in Scripture the Bible, the Bible says, Jesus says, God says and through a prophet or through him, himself, he says, stand still and watch and see my salvation. If you'll lean into him, if your marriage is struggling, your job situation struggling, your home life is tough, the battle belongs to him. If you're one of his children, he's there for you. And the beautiful thing about our passage of scripture today is it talks just about that. It talks about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is why we are here, folks. The kingdom of God is why we gather on a, a multi-times a week to get together and to pray and to talk about the Lord, to look at his word, to sing praises to his name. It's about that kingdom. And today we're in Luke chapter 17, and we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 37. And honestly, we're just going to walk through it together today because it just lends itself to that. But Jesus is talking to us about that kingdom. And there's a common theme that, that runs throughout Scripture in a lot of different areas that's called the already not yet. And that's really what one of the, the key ideas we're looking at in this passage today is that the kingdom of God has already come. It came in Jesus Christ. He brought it to earth. But yet, when we think about the kingdom, we're thinking about that ultimate kingdom, that kingdom when Jesus Christ will come and set up an earthly reign and he'll rule and reign forever and ever and we will be with him. That kingdom is still yet to come. So we have an already not yet kind of tension in this text of scripture and Jesus is trying to help his apostles and his disciples and those around him to understand that and to give them courage and strength but also to give them awareness and today as he speaks to us through this word that was written thousands of years ago but yet it's still relevant today it gives us strength it gives us hope to realize that there is a better day coming and as Christians as followers of Christ, we are not to be caught unaware. We are not to be those who, yes, it may, um, it, we, we don't know the, the day or the hour, but we're not to be caught off guard. We're to be working and laboring while we wait. If you can, I, I know we've been up and down a little bit, but I want you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's word as we read through this text of scripture together, beginning in verse 20, talking about the that coming kingdom, or that kingdom come. Verse 20, it says, Jesus, it says, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, see here or there, for you see the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he told the disciples, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. They will say to you, see here, there, or see here, don't follow or run after them, for as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. 
It will be like that on the day of the sun, the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a man on the housetop whose belongings are in the house must not come down to get them. Likewise, the man who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be working in a field together. One will be taken, the other left. Where, Lord, they asked him. He said to them, where the corpse is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, I pray now as we spend the next few moments applying it and looking at it in respect to our lives today, may you just be glorified and may you speak into our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. So we think about this passage of scripture. It's obviously, you know, Jesus is having a dialogue with his disciples. He's having a dialogue with the Pharisees. Uh, We've seen men healed. We've seen uh, him talk about the, the faith of a grain of mustard seed in this chapter that we're in right now. This dialogue continuing, the, the Pharisees, I, and I don't, I don't really believe this was a question that they were asking trying to trick him. I think they were really trying to figure some things out. They had heard a lot about the kingdom of God and what was going to happen, when it was going to come. And they ask him a question, and they say, when the kingdom of God would come? God, when is it coming? You see, there's two questions that are asked in here, first by the Pharisees and the second by the disciples. There's the when question, and then there's the where question. The Bible, asks, the, the Pharisees ask, when is this coming? And Jesus answers this, and he says, the kingdom of God is not coming with some observ- something observable. No one is going to say, see here or there. For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The reality, we got to first find out and we first see in this text of scripture is Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is not something that we're looking forward to. He's saying if you'll look ahead of you, the kingdom of God is right here among you. So many times we're always looking for something else. We're looking for something better. We're looking for something grander. We're looking for something greater. They were looking for some miraculous signs. They were looking for some some grandiose event uh, to, to usher in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, no, What you don't understand is the kingdom of God, you are looking at it. the, The kingdom of God is here right now amongst you. You are simply missing it. You see, so many times we get caught up in the grandeur of things. We get caught, they're ready for, the reason they miss it is that he wasn't doing it like they expected. He, they were expecting him to come that first time and set up that reign to overthrow the Roman army. You see the, the Pharisees and the Jews had been under oppression for a long time. They had been under the oppression of the Egyptians for over 400 years. They were under the oppression of the Babylonians for 70 plus years. Now they're under the oppression of the Roman government. And they wanted to go back to the Davidic kingdom. They wanted to go back to the time of David when they were a free people, when they were the cat's meow, when they were the ones ruling and reigning over the area. They didn't like what the, the situation they were in. So they were looking for a savior to come and set up a kingdom to overthrow Rome and reestablish the kingship of Israel and the leadership of Israel. But Jesus says, you're missing the point. The kingdom of God is here. If you'll just look to me, I'll have all the answers. If you look to me, I'll tell you the truth. Can I just tell you today, wherever you're looking for your life to change, wherever you're looking for that grand event, look to Jesus. He is the answer. The Bible says he is the author and finisher of our faith. Paul looks to him and Paul said that he pressed on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, his Lord. The reality is there are many who who may say, see here, this is it, or this is the way to go. This is the right place. This is the thing. Jesus says, look no further. The kingdom of God is here, folks. The kingdom of God, Jesus didn't take the kingdom with him. He brought the kingdom and he brought it to earth. Now it is our responsibility to go and tell a lost world about that kingdom and about that Savior and about that reality that if I want a better life, if I want 
peace and I want joy and I want things that are lasting, not just momentary happiness, not just a momentary pleasure, but lasting peace and joy and hope. It doesn't come through anything this earth has to offer. It only comes in Jesus. And he goes on and after he answers that question of the Pharisees, he then turns to his disciples and he says, the days are coming, verse 22, when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. Now, this is probably the most uh, direct way that Jesus communicates to his disciples that they're not going to be around when this kingdom comes. Uh, we kind of overlook this sometimes and run past it, but what Jesus is telling them here is you're going to long to see that day, but you're not going to see it in your lifetime. It's not going to happen. I think this is the first clue that we get that, that there is going to be time, and we're thankful for that time, aren't we? We're thankful that, and that God has been is tarried, and, and because of that, we are now a part of that kingdom. We've been, if you know Jesus Christ, you've adopted that kingdom, but he's letting them know that it's going to be some time. And then he goes on in verse 23 to say, they will say to you, be careful to what he's saying, because somebody's going to say, see here or see there. Don't follow or run after them. There are many false teachers. There are many false teachers in that day. There are many false teachers in this day who will still say, oh, Jesus, uh, the kingdom's already come. That's already happened. That happened back in 70 AD when the Jerusalem was overthrown. That was a judgment. And, and, and so we don't have a real millennium. We don't have a, there's not going to be this, uh, we're living in that time right now. Lord, I hope not. Lord, I hope this is not the best that we ever had to think about. But, but many false teachers will try to lead astray and they'll say, see, it's over here or see, it's over there. He says, be careful not to follow after those things. Can I just tell you, be careful who you listen to. Be careful what you follow. Be careful that when you begin to read after somebody, uh, you read this commentary or that commentary. And, and I'm not saying you always should read people that you agree with. I think we should read, it, read after people that we disagree with at times just to see where the other side's coming from. But I'm telling you, be careful when you read that you make sure it lines up with his word. Because commentary is just somebody's thoughts about God's word. This is God's word. This is what's infallible and inerrant and true with truth without any mixture of error. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. Be careful because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to come out here and try to pull you in this direction or pull you in that direction, trying to build a kingdom of their own. Do not run or follow after them. And then he gives them an assurance. We do understand that Jesus is coming back, right? Jesus is coming back one day to set up his rule and reign. He says, hey, you won't have to worry about knowing when I come back. He says, verse 24, for as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. Do you know what that means? Anybody ever been outside at night in a lightning storm? When it, when it lightnings at night, what happens? I mean, like he, the, from the whole sky, I mean, it, it just, it lights up. There is no doubt what is going on when you walk outside at night in a lightning storm, is there? What Jesus is saying is just like there's no doubt about that, when the Son of Man comes, nobody will wonder what's happening. There won't be anybody who's confused. Everybody will understand. Everybody will see. Everybody will know from horizon to horizon, Jesus will be magnified. He will be glorified. He will be seen. But then he reminds them, he says, but first, verse 25, but first it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. I love that reality that some, some say, uh, I think we got the NAS, NASB translation behind me. I hope it's not confusing. Um, but I love, I do like that translation. He says, first he must. It is necessary or he must. We, we call that in Scripture a divine imperative. Jesus is saying there is something first that I've got to do. Before I can set up this kingdom, before I can set up a rule and a reign on this earth, there is a necessary task that must be done. And that necessary task was to go to a cross because Jesus understood that Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. 
So if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, shed his blood on Calvary, you and I are hopelessly lost in our sinfulness. We sing a song, the choir has sang it here, I've sang it at a couple of different churches. It's called Love Ran Red. Basically what that song is saying is what held Jesus on the cross, what caused him to shed his blood, what caused him to hang there in agony, it was his love for you and for me. Most of us, there may be one or two people in this world that we would give our life for, that we would shed our blood for, but Jesus did it. As Romans 5, 8 tells us, while we were still sinners, while we were still hostile toward him, those people that punched him in the face, those people that beat his back, those people that plucked out his beard, those people that spit at him, those people who hurled insults at him, every one of those people, including you and I, is the reason he went to the cross. I must suffer many things. It was necessary so that we could have what we have today. It was necessary so that I could have hope. It was necessary so that I could have peace. It was necessary so that I could have joy. He must be rejected. We're in the process of celebrating that rejection. Isn't that, isn't that crazy to say that we're celebrating a rejection? We're celebrating the most horrible day in history that turned into the greatest day. In history because Jesus found it necessary to not just come and set up a kingship but to come and provide salvation can I tell you if you're here today and you've never experienced the love of Christ you've never experienced the peace and the hope of knowing that my sin is forgiven <laughs> everything I've done wrong is covered and I have hope in Jesus Christ, today you can experience that. Why? Because he was necessary that he suffer. But then he goes on to tell his disciples to look ahead. If you want to know what it's going to be like, you want to know how it's going to be when I come back to set up that kingdom, he says, well, in order to know what's going to happen, you got to look back. And he makes two references to stories in the book of Genesis. First of all, he says in verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Then he gives another, another illustration. He says it will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, but on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Now, we can get into the weeds a lot in that, and we can start dissecting all the, the various sins that were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, all the sins that were happening in Noah's day, where the Bible says that uh, in, in Genesis chapter 6, I think it's verse 9, where or somewhere in that neighborhood, where the Bible says that um, in those days, God, the, the thoughts and intents of people's hearts were continually evil all the time. Here's the reality. It was no different then than it is today. The reality of what Jesus is saying here is, is you want to know when it's going to happen? He, I mean, it's as clear as absolute mud right here. You want to know when it's going to happen? It's going to happen when everybody's going about their daily business with no thought of me, with no thoughts about God. They're taking care of their own life. They're doing their own thing. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage. We can, we can dissect all of those things. But the reality is, when, you, when, when it comes to life, in, in, in Noah's time, in Lot's time, the, the majority of people in those eras had no thought of God. They were concerned about their daily lives. They were concerned about their pleasures. Their appetite was their belly. In other words, whatever pleases me, what is the mantra for today? What has it been for, for decades? If it feels good, what? Do it. 
That's the mantra of secular society. Whatever pleases me the most is what I'm going to do. If that's sexual exploitations, if that's drugs and alcohol, if that's cheating other people to make more money, if it's cheating on my spouse to, because I think I can have something better over here, whatever it might be, if it feels good to me, it doesn't matter who else it hurts. It doesn't matter who else it affects. If it feels good to me, if it's good for me, then it's good, period. That's how it was in the days of Noah. That's how it was in the days of Lot. And can I tell you the truth? That's how it is today. So Jesus says when you see those things, when, when you see those things, that's how it's going to be. We're in that time. We've been in that time. We must realize that there's going to come a day when it's all going to change because what happened? On those, in those days, what happened? I think the illustrations are very, very poignant here. What happened? Everybody was going about their business. For 120 years, Noah preached and preached and preached and built and built and built. You know, I, I, get, I was telling the first service, I, I get tickled sometimes because we, we, we still have this idea. We have this idea that like Noah and Lot and people like that, you know, walked around grunting. Oh, oh, you know, had a club in their hand and, and they walked around with, you know, you know, leather skirts on and, you know, animal skin. And, you know, they just kind of lumbered around. We, 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 we think this, you know, prehistoric man. Do you, do you realize that is a fallacy made up by modern science? I mean, the first man ever created, Adam, what did he do? He named every animal ever named. Hello. That takes a little bit of intelligence, doesn't it? Noah, is anybody, who's been to Kentucky and seen the ark, the replica of the ark in Kentucky? Several of us. That's a pretty good sized boat. Um, just in case you didn't know, it's built to, you know, kind of to, to, to actual size. It took a, an intelligent person to build that boat an ingenuitive person, an engineering type person to build it. He had to use a leverage. He didn't have, you know, uh, forklifts. He didn't have uh, things like that, cranes to, to lift those things. He had to be, he was much more ingenuitive than we are today. These were brilliant people. And you know what I've learned? The more brilliant people get, I'm going to give you a good English word, the stupider we get. The more we learn, the more we reject God. What happened at Babel? God says when they were all there, if they got off the ark, they were all in one location, they began to build a tower to make a name for themselves to usurp the authority of God. Listen, it's the same lie, it's the same trick that Satan used when he fell, and he used to trick Adam and Eve in the garden. What does he always say? I want to be like God. Can I just tell you, you may want to be like God, but praise God, you never will be. And praise God, I never will be. I'm thankful that I don't have that. But I'm going to tell you, everything within me, and, and I know y'all are more spiritual than me, but everything in you wants to put you in charge of you. Did you hear that? Everything in you wants you to put you in charge of you. But can I tell you, when you're in charge of you, you're going to end up where you don't want to go. That's a lot of yous, but it's the truth. As it was in those days. But what happened? Noah preached all that time. He's building this ark. Everybody ignored him, but what happened? One day the rain came. One day the flood came. And it wiped out everybody. And Sodom and Gomorrah, they reached out. They tried to find some who were worthy. But on that day when Lot finally walked out of the city, what happened? As soon as he walked out of the city, fire and brimstone began to fall. What does that mean? This is the part we don't like to talk about. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming, and there's only one way to escape it. The only way to escape it is to know Christ. 
The only way to escape it is to do what comes in those very next verses. In verse 31, it says, On that day the man will be on the housetop who belongs, the man uh, on the housetop who, whose belongings are in the house must not come down to get them. Likewise, the man who is left in the field will not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. And then verse 33 is the key, the key here. Whoever tries to make life, his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Here's, here's, the, here's the crux of the matter. Jesus is saying there's going to come a time when it's going to happen quickly. When Sodom, when the fire and brimstone began to rain on Sodom, there was no time to go back. When Lot's wife looked back, she turned to a pillar of salt. He said, oh, you believe that? I, the word says that I believe it. Call me foolish, whatever you want to. When the rains came and the ark was shut, there was no more getting in. One day there's going to come a time when it's going to be too late. And I'm not here to scare you with that. That's not why I'm here, but I'm here to tell you the truth. You see, I wouldn't be much of a pastor, and we wouldn't be much as believers if we didn't tell people the truth. Tell them the reality of what's coming. That one, listen, right now, man, this is the most glorious time in the world to live. Why? Because right now, if there's breath in your body, there is opportunity to receive Christ. There is opportunity to give up your life and find it. Because you see, as I said a moment ago, if you is in control of you, you're on a road that's headed to destruction. That's what, that ver that's what verse 34 just said. I'm sorry, verse 33. If you try to secure your life, if you try to build your bank account, you try to build your reputation, you try to build your name, you try to build your kingdom, guess what? There's going to come a time when that kingdom's going to be wiped away, whether it's by flood, by fire and brimstone, by whatever means God chooses to use. There's going to come a time when that kingdom will fall. But if you'll say, you know what, I have no ability, if you'll just give up your life, if you'll wave the white flag and say, hey, God, I've tried to fight you, I've tried to do it my own way, but I realize, I'm, I, I'm, it, it's, it's, Jesus told Paul, you're kicking against the pricks, you're kicking against the goads, and you'll say, Lord, I, I need you. It's another song we sing, Lord, I need you. If you'll recognize your need for God and give up, the Bible says at that moment, you will actually find life. You'll find hope. You'll find everything you're looking for by pursuing it on your own, you can find it by simply giving up. Didn't say it'd be easy, but I said you could find it. And then he talks about the suddenness of it all in verses 34 and 35 and 30, 36. He says, I tell you that on that night, two will be in one bed, one will be taking the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taking the other left. Two men will be in the field together, one will be taking the other left. And he said, where, Lord? Second question, where? Where's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? It's already happened. Where's it going to happen? You'll see. You'll see. That last phrase in verse 37 is an odd one, but I want to explain it to you. It says, where the corpse is, there also the vultures will be gathered. What Jesus is saying is, is you'll know. You know what's going on. Anybody ever rode down the road and, and, and just you see over some woods or somewhere off as you're standing out by your house and, and you just see like three or four like these birds or vultures kind of just circling? You see, you, you, ever, you ever seen that? This means yes, that means no. Okay, yeah, there you go. Wake up, there we go. Got to get some participation here. When you see them circling, what do you know? What do you know? Something dead. That's right. You can say it southern. Something dead. Got some rope kill. That's right. Something is dead down yonder. When they're circling, there's something dead. They're not circling just because, ooh, let's get and find a pattern. They're circling because something is dead down there, and they're about ready to go have some grub. They're getting ready to go eat. Jesus is saying, just like the vault, where? Just like when you see the vulture circling, you know there's something dead. When you see these things, you'll know that I'm coming. And you'll know it's my time. You'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Can I just tell you something? What's he telling them? He's not telling them to go look up in the sky and look for vultures circling. He's telling them, keep working. Keep doing what you're called to do. Keep serving. Keep telling. Keep being in that field. 
Keep being out there grinding. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. And it should take you by surprise. Why? Because as we're out there telling people about Jesus, when he comes, guess what? It'll be the most glorious thing you've ever seen, and we'll know that we're going to be with him. Can I just tell you, sometime in the next two weeks, there's an event going to happen in our family. And can I just tell you, you said it better be less than two weeks. I said inside. I said inside of two weeks. She's over like, better be less than two weeks. Sometime in a very short while, a grand event is going to happen in our lives. One of the greatest blessings that's ever happened in my life is going to happen. And can I just assure you of one thing? Good English again. Ain't nobody not going to know about it. (laughs) Everywhere I go, I mean, you know, now you don't have the pictures that you flow out. You just have to pull your phone out. There's going to be pictures everywhere. I'm going to talk about it, and I'm going to celebrate it, and we're going to have all kind of great fun with it. But can I tell you? Something greater than that precious child that's about to come has already happened to me. And if you know Jesus, it's already happened to you. Yet what a shame and what a tragedy that many of us are quiet about it. That there's people that we walk beside and work beside and live beside every single day who have no clue that we know Jesus. What a shame. Shame on me. Shame on us. And what Jesus is telling his disciples is proclaim the kingdom until I come. Keep living for me. I must suffer some things. But that suffering brings you hope. That suffering brings you the greatest single thing that could ever happen in your life, and that is salvation in Jesus Christ. If we'll just accept him and lose our life for his sake, we can have it. But we're called to proclaim it. No greater, greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. And then Jesus called us his friends. He laid his life down for you. Will you give up your life for him? Would you pray with me?